Act One of the Purgatory of St. Patrick by Pedro Calderon de la Barca, translated by Dennis Florence McCarthy. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Purgatory of St. Patrick now first translated fully from the Spanish in the meter of the original, by Dennis Florence McCarthy. To Aubrey de Vere, whose legends of St. Patrick are among the most beautiful of English poems, this version of the celebrated legend of St. Patrick's Purgatory, as told by Calderon, is affectionately inscribed by the author. Persons Egerius, King of Ireland, read by Larry Wilson Patrick, read by Mike Manalakis. Luis Aeneas, read by Adrian Stevens. A Good Angel, read by Devorah Allen. A Bad Angel, read by Avai. Philip, read by Alan Mapstone. Leary, read by Jim Locke. A Captain, read by Algie Pug. Polonia. Daughter of the King, read by Rapunzelina. Lesbia, her sister, read by Matea Bracic. Paul, a peasant, read by Todd. Lucy, his wife, read by Sonia. First Canon, read by Joanna Michael Hoyt. Second Canon, read by David Purdy. Prior. Read by Andrew Gantz. Old Man. Read by David Purdy. A Muffled Figure. Read by Sandra. Stage Directions. Read by Tchaikovsky. The scene passes in Ireland, in the court of King Egerius, and other parts. The Purgatory of St. Patrick. Act the First. The Seashore with Precipitous Cliffs. Scene One. The king, Egerius, clad in skins, Leoger, Polonia, Lesbia, and a captain. Here let me die. Away. Oh, stop, my lord. Consider. Listen. Stay. Yes, from this rocky height, nigh to the sun, that with one starry light its rugged brow doth crown, headlong among the salt waves leaping down, let him descend who so much pain perceives. There let him raging die, who raging lives. Why wildly seekest thou the sea? Thou were to slip, my lord, what could it be? Every torment that doth dwell for ever with the thirsty fiends of hell, dark brood of that dread mother, the seven-necked snake whose poisoned breath doth smother the fourth celestial sphere. In fine, its horror and its misery drear within me reach so far that I myself upon myself make war when in the arms of sleep a living corse am I, for it doth keep such mastery o'er my life that as I dream a pale foreshadowing threat of coming death I seem. How could a dream, my lord, provoke you so? Alas, my daughters, listen, you shall know. From out the lips of a most lovely youth, And though a miserable slave in sooth, I dare not hurt him, and I speak his praise. Well, from the mouth of a poor slave, A blaze of lambent luster came, Which mildly burned in rays of gentlest flame, Till reaching you the living fire At once consumed ye two. I stood betwixt ye both, And though I sought to stay its fury, the strange fire would not molest or wound me, passing like the wind, so that, despairing, blind, I woke from out a deep abysm, of dream, a lethargy, a paroxysm. But find my pains the same, for still it seems to me I see that flame, and flying at every turn, see you consumed. But now I also burn." Light phantoms these, chimeras which an entrance find with ease into the dreamer's brain. A trumpet sounds. But wherefore sounds this trumpet? 
It is plain ships are approaching to a port below. Grant me thy leave, great lord, since thou dost know a trumpet in my ear sounds like a siren's voice, serene and clear. Ever to war inclined, in martial music my chief joy I find. Its clangor and its din lead my rapt senses on, for I may win through it my highest fame when soaring to the sun on waves of flame or wings as swift my proud name shall ascend there it may be with pallas to contend aside a stronger motive urges me to go if it is philip's ship i wish to know exit descend my lord with me down where the foam-curled head of the blue sea bows at the base of this majestic hill whose sands like chains of gold restrain its wilder will let it divert thy care the snow-white monster fair whose waves a dazzling hue shape silver frames round mirrors sapphire blue nothing can give relief nothing can now divert me from my grief that mystic fire will give my life no rest my heart and etna seems within my breast is any sight more fair can aught surpass that of a vessel breaking through the glass of crystal seas and seeming there to be as with light share it cuts the azure mass a fish of the wind a swift bird of the sea and being for two elements designed flies in the wave and swims upon the wind but now no witchery were it to any eyes that sight to see for lo the roused-up ocean heaving with all its mountain waves in motion wrinkles its haughty brow and suddenly awaking neptune his trident shaking ruffles the beauteous face so sweet and calm but now well may the sailor in his floating home expect a storm for lo in heaven's high vault rise pyramids of ice mountains of salt turrets of snow and palaces of foam Alonia returns o oh, dire misfortune what so suddenly has chance polonia this inconstant sea this babel of wild waves that seeks heaven's gate so great its fury and its rage so great driven by a draught accursed who would have thought that waves themselves could thirst has swallowed in the depths of its dread womb but now a numerous company to whom it concentrates below red sepulchres of coral tombs of snow in silver shining caves for from their prison out o'er all the waves as aeolus the winds let loose and they without a law to guide them on their way fell on that bark from which the trumpet rang a swan whose own sad obsequies it sang i from that cliff's stupendous height which dares to intercept the great sun's light looked full of hope along that vessel's track to see if it was philip who came back philip whose flag had borne upon the breeze thy royal arms triumphant through the seas when his sad wreck swept by and every sound was buried in a sigh his ruin seemed not wrought by seas or skies but by my lips and eyes because my cries the tears that made me blind increased still more the water and the wind how ye immortal deities would you still try by threatenings such as these what i can bear is it your wish that i should mount and tear this azure palace down as if the shape of a new nimrod i assumed to show how on my shoulders might the world escape nor, as I gaze below, feel any fear, though all the abysses under were rent with fire and flame, with lightning and with thunder. Scene 2. Patrick and then Luis Ennius. Patrick within. Ah, me! 
some mournful voice what's this the form as of a man who has escaped the storm swims yonder to the land and strives to give a life-sustaining hand unto another wretch when he appeared about to sink in death's last agony poor traveller from afar whom evil fate and thy malignant star on this far shore have cast let my voice guide thee if amid the blast my accents thou canst hear since it is only to rouse thy courage that i speak to thee come enter patrick and louise ennius clasping each other oh god save me oh the devil save me they move my pity these unhappy too not mine for what it is i never knew o oh, sirs if wretchedness can move most hearts to pity man's distress i will not think that here a heart can be so cruel and severe as to repel a wretch from out the wave pity for god's sake at your feet i crave i don't for i disdain it from god or man i never hope to gain it say who you are we then shall know what hospitable care your needs we owe but first i will inform you of my name lest ignorance of that perchance might claim exemption from respect and words be said unworthy of the deference and the dread that here my subjects show me or wanting the due homage that you owe me i am the king agarius the worthy lord of this small realm for thus i call it being mine till tis the world my sword shall not resign its valorous hope the dress not of a king but of wild savageness i wear to testify thus seeming a wild beast how wild i am no god my worship claims i do not even know the deities names here they no service nor respect receive to die and to be born is all that we believe now that you know how much you should revere my royal state say who you are then here patrick is my name my country ireland and a humble hamlet scarcely known to men called emthor is the place of birth it standeth midway twixt the north and west on a mountain which is guarded as a prison by the sea in the island which hereafter will be called the isle of saints to its glory everlasting such a crowd great lord therein will give up their lives as martyrs in religious attestation of the faith faith's highest marvel of an irish cavalier and of his chaste spouse and partner a french lady i was born unto whom i owe o oh, happy that was so beyond my birthright of nobility the vantage of the christian faith the light of christ's true religion granted in the sacred rite of baptism which a mark indelibly stampeth on the soul heaven's gate as it is the sacrament first granted by the church my pious parents having thus the debt exacted from all married people paid by my birth retired thereafter to two separate convents where in the purity and calmness of their chaste abodes they lived till the fatal line of darkness ending life was reached and they fortified by every practice of the catholic faith in peace yielded up their souls in gladness unto heaven their spirits giving giving unto earth their ashes i an orphan then remained carefully and kindly guarded by a very holy matron underneath whose rule i hardly had completed one brief lustrum five short years had scarce departed five bright circles of the sun wheeling round on golden axles twelve high zodiac signs illuming in one earthly sphere when happened through me an event that showed god's omnipotence and marvels since of weakest instruments god makes use of to enhance his majesty the more to show that for what men think the grandest and most strange effects to him should alone the praise be granted it so happened and heaven knoweth that it is not pride but rather pure religious zeal that men should know how the lord hath acted makes me tell it that one day to my doors a blind man rambled gormus was his name who said god who sends me here commands thee in his name to give me sight i obedient to the mandate made at once the sign of the cross on his sightless eyes that started into life and light once more from their state of utter darkness 
At another time, when heaven, muffled in the thickest, blackest clouds, made war upon the world, hurling at it lightning lances of white snow, which fell so thickly on a mountain that soon after they being melted by the sun, so filled up our streets and alleys, so inundated our houses, that amid the wild waves stranded they were ships of bricks and stone, barks of cement and of plaster, who before saw waves on mountains, who mid woods saw ships at anchor, I, the sign of the cross then made on the waters, and in accents, in a tone of grave emotion, in God's name, the waves commanded to retire. They turned that moment and left dry the lands they ravaged. O great God, who will not praise thee? Who will not confess thee, Master? Other wonders I could tell you, but my modesty throws shackles on my tongue, makes mute my voice, and my lips seals up and fastens. I grew up, in fine, inclined less to arms than to the marvels knowledge can reveal. I gave me almost wholly up to master sacred science, to the reading of the lives of saints, a practice which doth teach us faith, hope, zeal, charity, and Christian manners. In these studies thus immersed, I one day approached the margin of the sea with some young friends, fellow students and companions, when a bark drew nigh, from which suddenly outleaping landed armed men, fierce pirates they, who these seas, these islands, ravaged. We at once were captives made, and in order not to hazard losing us their prey, they sailed out to sea with swelling canvas. Of this daring pirate boat, Philip de Roque was the captain, in whose breast for his destruction, pride, the poisonous weed, was planted. He, the Irish seas and coast, having thus for some days ravaged, taking property and life, pillaging our homes and hamlets, but myself alone reserved to be offered as a vassal, as a slave to thee, O king. In thy presence, as he fancied, oh, how ignorant is man, when of God's wise laws regardless, when, without consulting him, he his future projects planneth. Philip, well, at sea might say so, since today, in sight of land here, heaven the while being all serene, mild the air, the water tranquil, in an instant, in a moment, he beheld his proud hopes blasted in the hollow-breasted waves. Roared the wind, the sea grew maddened, billows upon billows rolled mountain-high and wildly dashed them wet against the sun, as if they its light would quench and darken. The poop-lantern of our ship seemed a comet most erratic, seemed a moving exhalation, or a star from space outstarted. At another time it touched the profoundest deep sea-caverns, or the treacherous sands whereon ran the stately ship and parted. Then the fatal waves became monuments of alabaster, tombs of coral and of pearl. I, and why this boon was granted unto me by heaven, I know not, being so useless, with expanded arms, struck out, but not alone my own life to save, nay, rather, in the attempt to save this brave young man here, that life to barter, for I know not by what secret instinct towards him I am attracted and yet I think he will pay me back this debt with interest added. Finally, through heaven's great pity, we at length have happily landed, where my misery may expect it, or my better fate may grant it, since we are your slaves and servants, that being moved by our disasters, that being softened by our weeping, our sore plight may melt your hardness, our affliction force your kindness, and our very pains command you. Silence, miserable Christian! For my very soul seems fastened on thy words, compelling me, how I know not, to regard thee with strange reverence and fear, thinking thou must be that vassal, that poor slave, whom in my dream I beheld out-breathing flashes, saw out-flashing living fire, in whose flame so lithe and lambent my Polonia and my Lesbia, like poor moths, were burned to ashes. No, the flame that from my mouth issued is the true evangel, is the doctrine of the gospel. Tis the word which I am commanded unto thee to preach, O king, to thy subjects and thy vassals, to thy daughters, who shall be Christians through its means. Cease. Uh, fasten thy presumptuous lips, vile Christian, for thy words insult and stab me. Stay. And wilt thou in thy pity try to save him from his anger? Yes. Forbear, and let him die. Thus to die by a king's hands here were unjust. Aside. 
It is my pity for these Christians, prompts my answer. If this second Joseph, then, like the first one, would unravel, would interpret the king's dreams, do not dread the result, my father, for if my being seen to burn indicates in any manner I should ever be a Christian, as impossible a marvel such would be, as if, being dead, I could rise and live thereafter. But in order that your mind may be turned from such just anger, let us hear now who this other stranger is. Then be attentive, beautiful divinity, for my history thus commences. Great Egerius, king of Ireland, I, by name, am Louis Ennius, and a Christian also, this being the sole point of resemblance betwixt Patrick and myself, yet a difference presenting, for although we two are Christians, so distinct and so dissevered are we, that not good from evil is more opposite in its essence, yet, for all that, in defence of the faith I believe and reverence, I would lose a thousand lives, such the esteem for it I cherish. Yes, by God, the oath alone shows how firmly I confess him. I, no pious tales or wonders, worked in my behalf by heaven, have to speak of? No, dark crimes, robberies, murders, sacrileges, treasons, treacheries, betrayals, must I tell instead, however vain it be in me to glory in my having such effected. I, in one of Ireland's many isles, was born, the planet Seven, I suspect, in wild abnormal interchange of influences, must have, at my hapless birth-time, all their various gifts presented, fickleness the moon implanted in my nature, subtle Hermes, with and genius ill employed, better ne'er to have possessed them. Wanton Venus gave me passions, all the flatteries of the senses, and stern Mars a cruel mind. Mars and Venus both together, what will they not give? The sun gave me an easy temper, prone to spend, and when means failed me, theft and robbery were my helpers. Jupiter, presumptuous pride, thoughts fantastic and unfettered gave me. Saturn, rage and anger, valour, and a will determined on its ends, and from such causes followed the due consequences, here from Ireland being banished, by a cause I do not mention. Through respect to him, my father came to Perpignan, and settled in that Spanish town, when I, scarce my first ten years had ended, and when sixteen came, he died, May God rest his soul in heaven. Orphaned, I remained the prey of my passions and my pleasures, o'er whose tempting plain I ran, without rein or curb to check me. The two poles of my existence, on which all the rest depended for support, were play and women. What a base on which to rest me! Here my tongue would not be able to acquaint you in extenso with my actions. A brief abstract may, however, be attempted. I, to outrage a young maiden, stabbed to death a noble elder, her own father, for the sake of his wife. A most respected cavalier I slew as he lay beside her in the helpless state of sleep, his honour bathing in his blood, the bed presenting a sad theatre of crimes, murder and adultery blended. Thus the father and the husband life for honour's sake surrendered, for even honour has its martyrs. May God rest their souls in heaven. Dreading punishment for this, I fled hastily, and entered France, where my exploits, methinks, time will cease not to remember, for, 
assisting in the wars which at that time were contended bravely betwixt France and England, I took military service under Stephen the French king, and a fight which chance presented showed my courage to be such that the king himself, as guerdon of my valour, gave to me the commission of an ensign. How that debt I soon repaid, I prefer not now to tell thee. Back to Perpignan thus honoured I returned, and having entered once a guardhouse there to play, for some trifle I lost temper, struck a sergeant, killed a captain, and maimed others there assembled. At the cries from every quarter speedily the watch collected, and in flying to a church as they hurried to prevent me, I a catchpole killed. T'was something one good work to have effected, mid so many that were bad. May God rest his soul in heaven. Far I fled into the country, and asylum found and shelter in a convent of religious which was founded in that desert, where I lived retired and hidden, well taken care of and attended. For a lady there, a nun, was my cousin, which connection gave to her the special burden of this care, my heart already being a basilisk, which turned all the honey into venom, passing swiftly from mere liking to desire, that monster ever, feeding on the impossible living fire that with intensest fury burns when most opposed flame the wind revives and strengthens false deceitful treacherous foe which doth murder its possessor in a word desire in him who nor god nor law respecteth of the horrible of the shocking thinks but only to attempt it Yes, I dared, but here disturbed when my lord I this remember, mute the voice in horror fails, sad the accent faint and trembles, and as mid the night's dark shadows the hair stands on end through terror, thus confused, so full of doubt, sad remembrance so o'erwhelms me, that the thing I dared to do i scarce dare in words to tell thee for in fine my crime is such so to be abhorred detested so profane so sacrilegious strange upon thee so to press it that for having such committed i at times feel some repentance well in fine i dared one night when deep silence had erected sepulchres of fleeting sleep for men's o'er-wearied senses when a dark and cloudy veil heaven had o'er its face extended mourning which the wind assumed for the sun whose life had ended in whose obsequies the night-bird swan-songs sang instead of verses and when back from waves of sapphire where their beauty was reflected the clear stars a second time trembling lights to heaven presented well on such a night by climbing o'er the garden wall i entered with the assistance of two friends for when such things are attempted an associate never fails and in horror and in terror seeking in the dark my death reached at length the cell i tremble to remember it in which was my cousin whom respectful silence bids me not to name though all self-respect has left me frightened at such nameless horror on the hard floor she fell senseless when she passed into my arms and ere she regained her senses she already was outside her asylum in a desert when if heaven possessed the power it had not the will to help her women when they are persuaded 
that the wildest of excesses are the effects of love, forgive them easily, and therefore pleasure following tears, some consolation in her miseries was effected, though in fact they were so great that, united in one person, she saw violence, violation, incest, nay, adultery even, against God, who was her spouse, and a sacrilege most dreadful. Finally, we left that place, being carried to Valencia by two steeds that might well claim from the winds to be descended, feigning that she was my wife. But with little peace we dwelt there, for I quickly, having squandered whatsoever little treasure I brought with me, without friends, without any hope of help there, in my dire distress appealed to the beauty still so perfect of my poor pretended wife. If for aught I did I ever could feel shame, this act alone would surely overwhelm me, since it is the lowest baseness that the vilest breast descends to, to put up to sell one's honour and to trade in love's caresses. Scarce with shameless front had I this base plan to her suggested, when, concealing her design, she gave seeming acquiescence. But I scarce had turned my back, hardly had I left her presence, when she, flying from me, found grace, a convent's walls to enter, there a holy monk advising, she a saving port and shelter, found against the world's wild storms, and there died, a sin, a penance, giving all a great example. May God rest her soul in heaven, seeing the narrow world now took note of my offences, and that soon the very land might reject me. I determined to reseek my native country, for at least I there expected to be safer from my foes, in a place so long my centre and my home, the way I took and to Ireland came, which welcomed me at first as would a mother, but a stepmother resembled before long, for, seeking a passage where a harbour lay protected by a mole, I found that corsairs lay concealed within the shelter of a little creek, which is out of view their well-armed vessel. And of these their captain Philip took me prisoner, after efforts made in my defence so brave, that in deference to the metal I displayed, my life he spared. What ensured you know already, how the wind in sudden anger, rising into raging tempest, now chastised us in its pride, now our lives more cruelly threatened, making in the seas and mountains such wild ruin and resemblance, that to mock the mountain's pride waves still mightier forms presented, which, with catapults of crystal, made the cliff's foundations tremble, so that neighbouring cities fell, and the sea in scornful temper, gathering up from its abysses the munition it collecteth, fired upon the land its pearls in their shells, wherein, engendered by the swift breath of the morning, in its dew they shine resplendent tears of ice and fire. In fine, not in pictures so imperfect, all our time to waste, the crew went to sup in the infernal halls themselves. I, too, a guest, would have equally attended with them. If this Patrick here whom I know not why I reverence, looking with respect and fear on his beauteous countenance ever, had not drawn me from the sea, where, exhausted, sinking, helpless, 
I drank death in every draught, agony in each salt wave's venom. This my history is, and now I wish neither life nor mercy, neither that my pain should move thee, nor my asking should compel thee, save in this to give me death, that thus may the life be ended of a man who is so bad that he scarcely can be better. Louis, though thou art a Christian, which by me is most detested, yet I so admire thy courage that I wish before all present between thee and him to show how my power can be exerted, how it punishes as rewards, how it elevates and depresses. And so thus my arms I give thee, that within them thus extended thou mayest reach my heart, to thee thus beneath my feet to tread thee. He throws Patrick on the ground and places his foot upon him. The two actions signifying how the heavier scale descendeth, and that, Patrick, thou mayest see how I value or give credit to thy threats, thy life I spare. Vomit forth the flame incessant of the so-called word of God, that by this thou mayest be certain I do not adore his godship, nor his miracles have dread of. Live then, but in such a state of poor, mean, and abject service as befits a useless hind in the fields. And so, as shepherd, I would have thee guard my flocks, which are in these vales collected. Let us see, if for the purpose of this mystic fire outspreading, being my slave, thy God will free thee from captivity and thy fetters. Exit. Patrick moves my heart to pity. Exit. Not so mine, for none I cherish. Had I any, none would move me sooner than this Louis Aeneas. Exit. Scene 3. Patrick and Louis. Louis, through a low position, mine is here, and I observe thee raised to fortune's highest summit. Yet I feel more grief than envy at thy rise. Thou art a Christian. Show thyself one now in earnest. Patrick, let me now enjoy the first favours fate has sent me after so much sad misfortune. One word, then, if thou wilt let me so presume, I ask of thee. What is that? Upon this earth here, once again, alive or dead, that we two shall meet together. Such a word dost ask me? Yes. Then I give it. I accept it. Exunt. Scene 4. A hamlet near the court of Egerius. Philip and Lucy. Pardon if I have not known how to serve you as I ought. For much more than you have thought must you my forgiveness own. For when I your kind face view, pain and pleasure being at war, I have much to thank you for, and have much to pardon too. Thanks with which my heart is rife are for life restored and breath. Pardon, for you give me death, as before you gave me life. For such flattering declarations, rude and ignorant am I, so my arms will give reply, which gets rid of explanations. Let their silent interfacing figure what my words should be. Scene 5. Paul, the same. Paul, aside. Hey, sirs, what is this I see? Someone here my wife's embracing. What's to do? I burn, I burst. Kill her? Yes. "'Twas fortune sent me. "'One thing only doth prevent me, "'which is, she might kill me first. "'For your hospitable care, "'beauteous mountaineer, "'I would that this ring's bright diamond "'could far outshine a star of air.' Oh, "'Think me not a woman 
who lives intent her gain to make but i take it for your sake paul aside what i wonder should i do but if i'm her husband then as i saw him give the ring silence is the proper thing in these arms i once again give to you my soul for i have no other ring or chain where i ever could remain for such sweet captivity lures me from the miseries of remembering my sad fate caused as you have seen so late by these crystalline blue seas paul aside what a new embrace hello don't you see sir odds my life that this woman is my wife here's your husband in full view he has seen us i must straight leave you and return aside ah oh, me couldst thou this polonia see thou mightst mourn perhaps the state unto which i see me doomed and o oh, heaven aspiring sea say in what vast depths can be all the lives thou hast entombed exit scene six paul and lucy afterwards philip paul aside as he's gone i'll louder speak this time lucy mine i've caught you so a present i have brought you see this window bar twill wreak my vengeance oh how malicious bless me grumbler what grimaces than to witness two embraces does not look at all suspicious was it malice then in me not plain seeing malice merely for a husband how so nearly he may pry should never see more than half his wife doth do well with that i'm quite content to that condition i assent and since twice embraced by you has that rascal soldier been whom the sea spewed out in spite i will juggle with my sight and pretend but once to have seen and as i for two embraces meant to give a hundred blows i but fifty now propose for one half of my disgraces i have totted up the score you yourself the sentence gave yes by god i swear you'll have fifty strokes and not one more i've admitted far too much for a husband it would be quite preposterous he should see but the quarter even as such i acknowledge the appeal patience and your back prepare for the now admitted share five and twenty blows you'll feel no not so you're still astray then say why between us two you're to trust not what you view but what i am pleased to say better far i think twould be daughter of the devil that you held the stick and used it too with it well belaboring me is to greed what i propose yes then let us both change places give to him the two embraces and to me the hundred blows philip returns philip aside has the peasant gone i wonder at the nick of time you're here so sir soldier lend an ear obligation i am under for the favours you have meant to bestow so liberally on my cot my wife and me and though i'm well content with you yet as you're progressing day by day in getting stronger it is best you stay no longer take the road then with god's blessing leave my house for it would be sad in it to raise my hand 
leaving you dead flesh on land, who were to living fish at sea. The suspicion that you show is quite groundless. Do not doubt it. Zoons, with reason or without it, am I married, sir, or no? Scene 7. Leoger, an old peasant, and Patrick. So tis ordered, and that he, serving here from day to day, in the open field, should stay. Yes, I say it so shall be. But who's this, O oh, happiness, since tis Philip's form I greet? Mighty lord, I kiss thy feet. Mighty lord, does he call him? Yes. Now lay on the blows you owe. Now, friend Paul, the moment charms. Give me good look ere your arms. Honour in them you bestow. Is it possible once more that alive I see thee? Here, trophy of a fate severe, the sea flung me on this shore, where, their willing aid secured, I have lived these peasants' guest, till I could repair with rest all the sufferings I endured. And besides, I thought with dread on the angry disposition of the king. For his ambition, when has it or bowed the head, or with patience heard related the sad tragedies of fate hopeless and disconsolate in this solitude i've waited till some happy chance might rise when no longer i should grieve and the king should give me leave to appear before his eyes that already has been given thee for so sad was he believing thou wert dead so deep his grieving all the past will be forgiven thee since thou livest come with me fortune will once more embrace thee in his favour to replace thee let my happy privilege be for that late unseeming brawl see me humbly bending low you my lord prince philip know that i am one juan paul my suspicion and abuse Pray forgive, your majesty. Think that what I say to thee was but cackled by a goose. At your service, night and day, are whatever goods I've got. Lucy here, myself, and Cot. And God bless us all, I pray. For your hospitality I am grateful, and I trust to repay it. If you must let the first installment be just to take my wife away thus you will reward us too she'll be glad to go with you i without her glad to stay exunt philip and leoger lucy aside oh, was there ever love so vain as is mine a brief caress cradled in forgetfulness one paul as we remain here alone, twere well to greet as a friend this labourer newly sent us. Nay, good sir, I am a slave, and I entreat that as such you understand me. I, the lowest of the low, hither come to serve, and so I implore that you command me as a slave, since I am one. Oh, what modesty! What humility! What good looks, too, and gentility! I, in truth, can't help being drawn by his face. Came ever here? This is quite between us two. Any wandering stranger who did not draw you so, my dear? Eh, my Lucy? Oh, boorish base is your vile insinuation! Against my innocent inclination for the whole of the human race. Exit. To your sharpness and good will, Paul, I trust a thing that may cost my life. Then don't delay. Tell it, since you know my skill. 
This new slave that here you see, I suspect is not secure, and I hasten to procure means by which he more may be. For the present, I confide him to your care, by day or night. Let him not escape your sight, ever watchful keep beside him. Exit. Scene 8. Patrick and Paul. Paul aside. I'm to keep what you discarded, good in faith. To Patrick. Behold in me your strict guard, in you I see the sole thing I ever guarded in my life, with such a care I can neither sleep nor eat. If you wish to use your feet, you can go, your road lies there. Nay, in flying quickly hence, you to me a good will do, since my care will fly with you. Go in peace. With confidence you may trust me, for I'm not, though a slave, a fugitive. Lord, how gladly do I live in this solitary spot, where my soul in raptured prayer may adore thee, or in trance see the living countenance of thy prodigies, so rare. Human wisdom, earthly lore, solitude reveals and reaches. What diviner wisdom teaches in it, too, I would explore. Tell me, talking thus apart, who is it on whom you call? Great primeval cause of all, thou, O Lord, in all things art. These blue heavens, these crystal skies, formed of dazzling depths of light, in which sun, moon, stars unite, are they not but draperies hung before thy heavenly land? The discordant elements, water, fire, earth, air immense, prove they not thy master hand? Or in dark or brightsome hours, praise they not thy power and might? O'er the earth dost thou not write in the characters of flowers thy great goodness? And the air, in reverberating thunder, does it not in fear and wonder say, O Lord, that thou art there? Are not, too, thy praises sung by the fire and water, each dowered for this divinest speech, with tongue the wave, the flame with tongue? Here, then, in this lonely place, I, O Lord, may better be since in all things I find thee, thou hast given to me the grace of obedience, faith, and fear. As a slave, then, let me stay, or remove me where I may, serve thee truly, if not here. An angel descends, holding in one hand a shield in which is a mirror, and in the other hand a letter. Scene 9. An angel, the same. Patrick. Ah, who calls me? Why, no one calls. Aside. The man is daft. Poetry should be his craft. Patrick. Ah, who calls me? I. Paul, aside. Who he speaks to, I can't see. Well, to stop his speech were hard. I'm not here his mouth to guard. Exit. Scene 10. The Angel and Patrick. Ah, it cannot be to me come such glory. For behold, pearl and rosy dawn in one shines a cloud from which its sun breaks in crimson and in gold. Living stars its robe adorning, rose and jasmine sweetly blended. Dazzling comes that vision splendid, scattering purple pomps of morning. Patrick! Sunlight strikes me blind. Heavenly Lord, who canst thou be? I am Victor whom to thee God thy angel guard assigned, with this scroll to give it thee, gives him the letter. I am sent. Sweet messenger, paranymph of all things fair, who amidst the hierarchy of the highest hosts of heaven singest in melodious tone, glory unto thee alone, holy, holy Lord be given. Read the letter. With amaze, I see here to Patrick. Oh, can a slave be honored so? Open it. It also says, Patrick, Patrick, hither come, free us from our slavery. More it means than I can see, since I do not know by whom I am called. Oh, faithful guide, speedily dispel my error. Look into this shining mirror. 
Heavens! What seest thou inside? Numerous people there seem thronging, old men, children, women, who seem to call to me. Nor do you stay but satisfy their longing. You behold the Irish nation, who expect to hear God's truth. From your lips, O chosen youth, leave your slavery. The vocation God has given thee is to sow faith o'er all the Irish soil. There as legate thou shalt toil, Ireland's great apostle, go, first to France, to German's home, the good bishop. There thou'lt make thy profession, there thou'lt take the monk's habit, and to Rome, pass where letters thou'lt procure, for that mighty work of thine, in the bowls of Celestine. Thou wilt visit then in Tours, Martin, the great bishop there, now upborne upon the wind, come with me, for thou wilt find God has given with prescient care his commands to all, that so fitly thy great work be done. But tis time we should be gone. Let us on our journey go. They disappear. End of Act One Act Two of the Purgatory of St. Patrick by Pedro Calderon de la Barca, translated by Dennis Florence McCarthy. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act the Second Hall of a Tower in the Palace of Egerius. Scene One Luis and Polonia. Yes, Polonia, yes, for he who betrays inconstancy has no reason for complaining that another love is gaining on his own, that fault will be ever punished so. For who proudly soars that does not fall? Therefore, tis that I forestall, Philip's love, however so true, he is nobler to the view, as one nobly born may be, but in that nobility which one's self can win and wear, I, with justice, may declare I am nobler far than he, I more honour have obtained than on Philip's cradle reigned. Let the fact excuse the boast for this land from coast to coast rings with victories i have gained three years is it since i came to these isles it seems a day three swift years have rolled away since i made it my chief aim thee to serve my highest fame trophies numerous as the sand mars might envy has my hand won for thy great sire and thee being the wonder of the sea and the amazement of the land louis yes thy gallant bearing or inherited or acquired has within my breast inspired a strange fear a certain daring oh i know not if declaring this tis love for blushes rise at perceiving with surprise that at last hath come the hour when my heart must own the power of a deity i despise this alone i'll say that here long thy hope had been fruition but that i the disposition of the king my father fear but still hope and persevere scene two philip the same philip aside if to find my death i come why precipitate my doom but so patient who could be as to not desire to see what impends how dark it glooms then what pledge may i demand of your faith this hand not so how to hinder it i shall know more of this i must withstand woe is me wilt give thy hand to this outcast of the wave 
and o oh, thou to whom pride gave the presumption to aspire to a son's celestial fire knowing that thou wert my slave why thus dare to come between me and mine because i dare be what now i am nor care more to be what i have been it is true that i was seen once your slave for who indeed can the fickle wheel control but in nobleness of soul the best blood of all your breed i can equal nay exceed exceed me vile homicide wretch in having thus replied you have made a slight mistake no if such you did not make you've done worse say what you've lied villain traitor strikes him in the face o oh, ye skies for so many injuries why not instant vengeance take when volcanic fires awake in my breast and hell flames rise they draw their swords scene three egerius and soldiers the same what is this a lasting woe a misfortune an abuse a sharp pain a fiend let loose from the infernal pit below let no one presume to go twixt me and revenge reflect fury breathes immortal breath vengeance has no fear of death nor for any man respect i my honour must protect seize him let the man who sighs for his death obey you'll see how the boldest fares for he even before your very eyes shall be slain that this should rise follow him in desperate mood plunging headlong in red blood like a sea both wide and deep thus courageously i leap seeking philip through the flood all enter fighting scene four but i wanted this alone after what i've heard that he who escaped from slavery and to distant rome had flown now with the purpose too well known as to ireland come again where proclaiming the new reign of the faith he has enticed many to believe in christ rending all the world in twain a magician he must be since condemned so rumour saith by some other kings to death he though tied upon the tree in an instant set him free with such prodigies of wonder that the earth within whose womb the dead lie as in a tomb trembled the air groaned and thundered dark eclipse the sun lay under deigning not a single glance of his radiant countenance to the moon from which i see that this patrick for tis he lords it over fate and chance awestruck by the prodigy fearing they may punish be crowds attend him on his way and tis said that he to-day comes to try his spells on me let him come and once for all wave in vain his conjuring rod we shall see who is this god whom their god the christians call by my hand must patrick fall were it but to see if he can escape his destiny or my will subvert and master he this bishop he this pastor he pope's legate though he be scene five the captain soldiers luis a prisoner the king Louis, sire, without delay we secured, but not before he killed three and wounded more of our company. Christians say, why do you no fear display, seeing now in angry mood my hand raised to shed your blood? But in vain do I deplore, since he this deserves and more who has done a Christian good. Gifts, not chastisement, should be thine to-day, for it is plain it is i should feel the pain for conferring good on thee 
Ah, take him hence, and presently let him die, and be it known why from him has mercy flown. Tis not for his crimes or guilt that this Christian's blood is spilt. Tis for Christ's belief alone. Exunt. Scene six. Luis. If for this I die, to me thou the happiest death allottest, since he for his God will die, he who dies to him honour, and a man whose life is here but a round of cares and crosses should be grateful unto death as the end of all his sorrows, since it comes the tangled thread of a wretched life to shorten, which today the evil phoenix of its works that now prove mortal would revive amid the ashes of my wrong and my dishonour. Then my life my breath were poison, venom would my breast but foster, until I had shed in Ireland blood in such a copious torrent, that, though base, it might wash out the remembrance of my wronger. Ah, my honour, lo, thou liest, by a ruthless foot downtrodden, I will die with thee united. We too will together conquer these barbarians. Then, since little but a span at best belongeth to my life, a noble vengeance, let this dagger take upon me. But, good God, what evil impulse with demoniac instinct prompteth thus my hand? I am a Christian, I have a soul, and share the godly light of faith. Then were it right, mid a crowd of Gentile mockers, thus the Christian faith to tarnish by an action so improper? What example would I give them by a death so sad and shocking, save that I thus gave the lie to the works that Patrick worketh, since they'd say, who worship only their own vices, most immodest, who deny the soul its eternal joy or torment. Of what use is Patrick's preaching that man's soul must be mortal if the Christian Louis Ennius kills himself? He can't acknowledge its eternal life who'd lose it. Thus, with actions so discordant, he the light and I the shadow, we would neutralize each other. Tis enough to be so wicked as even now to feel no sorrow, no repentance for past sins. Rather, a desire for others. Yes, by God, for if escape fortune now my life would offer europe africa and asia i would fill with fear and horror first extracting here the debt of a vengeance so enormous that these islands of egerius would not hold a single mortal who should not appease the thirst that insatiable longing that i have for blood the lightning when it bursts its prison portals, warns us in a voice of thunder, and then twixt dark smoke and forked fires that take the shape of serpents, fills the trembling air with horror. I, too, gave that thunder voice, so that all men heard the promise, but the lightning bolt was wanting. Yes, ah, me, it proved abortive, and before it touched the earth was by dallying winds made sport of. No, it is not death that grieves me, even a death of such dishonour. Tis because at last 
are ended in my youth's fresh opening blossom my offences life i wish for to begin from this day forward greater and more dread excesses heavens tis for no other object scene seven polonia luis polonia aside now with mind made up i come luis an occasion offers ever as the test and touchstone of true love by certain knowledge have i learned the imminent danger of thy life the wrath grows hotter of my father and his fury to evade is most important all the guards that here are with thee has my liberal hand suborned so that at the clink of gold have their ears grown deaf and torpid fly and that thou mayest see how a woman's heart can prompt her how her honour she can trample how her self-respect leave prostrate with thee i will go since now it is needful that henceforward i in life and death am thine for without thee life were worthless thou who in my heart dost live i bring with me gems and money quite enough to the most distant parts of india to transport us where the sun with beams and shadows scatters frost or burning scorches at the door two steeds are standing i should rather call these horses two swift lynxes air-born creatures thoughts by liveliest minds begotten they so rapid are that though we as fugitives fly on them an assurance of our safety we shall feel at once resolve then why thus ponder what delays thee time is pressing therefore shorten all discourse and that mischance which disturbs love's plans so often may not offer an obstruction to so well prepared a project first before thee i will go issue while in specious converse i divert thy guards and give to thy coming forth a cover even the sun our project favours which amid the west waves yonder sinking dips his golden curls to refresh his glowing forehead exit scene eight luis a most opportune occasion to my hands has fortune offered since heaven knows that all the show of apparent love and fondness which i proffered to polonia was assumed it being my object she should go with me where i seizing on the gold and costly gems she carries so might issue from this babylonian bondage for although in my person was esteemed and duly honoured still twas slavery after all and my free wild life was longing for that liberty heaven's best gift which i had enjoyed so often but a great embarrassment and a hindrance were a woman for the end i have in view since in me is love a folly that never passes appetite which being satisfied no longer care i for a woman's presence how so fair or so accomplished and since thus my disposition is so free of what importance is a murder more or less at my hands must die polonia for her loving at a time when there's no one loved or honoured had she loved as others love then she would have lived as others exit scene nine the captain then the king philip and leogar to sad sentence of his death have i come by the king's orders here to read to louis ennius but what's this the door lies open and the tower deserted ha soldiers no one answers ho oh, there guards come hither treason treason 
Enter the king, Philip, and Leoger. Why these outcries? This commotion, what is this? That Louisenius has escaped, and from the fortress all the guards have fled. My lord, I saw, entering here, Polonia. Heavens! Beyond all doubt was she who released him. That her lover he dared call him you well know. Jealousy and rage provoke me to pursue them. A new Troy will to-day be Ireland's story. Exit. Give me to a horse. In person I these fugitives will follow. Ah, what Christians are these two who with actions so discordant one deprives me of my rest, and the other robs my honour. But the twain shall feel the weight of my vengeful hands fall on them, for not safe from me would be even their sovereign Roman pontiff. Exunt. Scene 10. A wood at whose extremity is Paul's cabin. Polonia flying wounded, and Luis with a naked dagger in his hand. Oh, hold thy bloody hand! Though love be dead, let Christian faith command. My honour take, but, oh, my poor life's pair, That suppliant at thy feet pours out its humble prayer. Hapless Polonia, since creation's hour, Beauty has ever one unvarying dower. It brings misfortune with it, it is this, Makes beauty rarely live long time with bliss. I who less pity feel than any headsman who e'er held to death's steel, may by thy death procure my life, since with it I will go secure. If thee I bring where fortune's hand may guide me, I bring the witness of my woes beside me, by whom they may pursue me, track me, discover me, in fact, undo me, if here I leave thee living, I leave thee angry, vengeful, unforgiving, leave thee, in fact, to be one enemy more, and what an enemy. Thus equally I grieve thee, thus evil do whether I take or leave thee, and so tis better thus that i a wretch cruel and infamous false impious fierce abandoned wicked band by god and man should slay thee by my hand since buried here within the rustic entrails dark and drear of this rude realm of stone my worst misfortune shall remain unknown my fury too shall gain a novel kind of vengeance when that slain remaining satisfied that philip too by the same stroke has died if in thy heart he lived and then mine ire will need no victim more except thy sire through thee first came my first disgrace the cause of all my shame and so the first of all on thee my vengeful strokes shall furious fall ah me my fate pursuing i have but only worked my own undoing like the worm that by its subtle art spins its own grave has thou a human heart i am a demon so to prove it die thus god of patrick listen to my cry he stabs her several times and she falls within she fell on flowers there sowing both lives and horrors in her blood outflowing thus now with greater ease i can escape and carry o'er the seas in many a gem and chain treasure enough to make me rich in spain until so changed by time disguised by wandering in a foreign clime i may return to reap my vengeance for a wrong doth never sleep 
but whither do i stray treading the shades of death in this dark way my path is lost i go whither i do not know perchance escaping from my prison bands to fall again into my tyrant's hands if dark night doth not my sight deceive yonder a rustic cabin i perceive yes i am right i'll knock i can't much err uh, they'll know the way he knocks scene eleven paul and lucy luis lucy within who's there a traveller benighted his way lost confused distressed good worthy husbandman disturbs thy rest lucy within oh juan how oh, you snore awake there's someone knocking at the door paul within why i am well enough here in my bed he knocks for you so answer him instead lucy within who's there a traveller i say paul within a traveller yes paul within then travel on i pray this cabin is no inn sir not a bit i'm getting weary of this fellow's wit i'll try what kicking in the door will do drives in the door ay there it goes lucy within why juan paul hello awake i say for if i don't mistake the door's knocked in paul within well one eye is awake but underneath its lid the other's laid come with me lucy for i'm sore afraid enter paul and lucy who's there be silent peasants and attend if you would not now your lives should end lost in this woodland waste i sought your door and so my friend make haste to tell me the best way from this to the port where i by break of day may from the coast get clear go right ahead first take the pathway here then left then right again rise where there's hill descend where there's a plain and going thus in short the port you'll reach when you have reached the port tis better that you come along with me or oh, by the heavens o'erhead your blood shall stain the ground on which you tread were it not better cavalier to pass the night here till the dawn appear how very kind you are when least expected are you already to this night infected choose now at once i say to die or guide me don't be vexed i pray if i without more haggling or vain clack select to go and carry you on my back if so you choose tis not that death i fear but just to disappoint my lucy here Luis aside that he may not betray whither i go to those who track my way him from some cliff i'll throw headlong amid the icy waves below to lucy you with this consolation here remain your husband will be with you soon again exunt the two at one side and she at the other Scene twelve The King Egerius, Lesbia, Leoger, the Captain, afterwards Philip. Not a trace of them is found. All the mountain, hill, and valley, leaf by leaf, has been explored, bough by bough has been examined, rock by rock has been searched through. Still no clue wherewith to track them can we light on. Without doubt, to preserve them from my anger, 
has the earth engulfed the two for not heaven itself could guard them from my wrath if still they lived see the sun his disentangled golden tresses far extends over mountains groves and gardens showing that the day hath come enter philip deign your majesty to hearken to a tragedy more dreadful to a crime more unexampled than has time or fortune ever yet recorded in earth's annals seeking traces of polonia through these savage woods distracted i roamed restless all the night-time till at length and amid the darkness half awakened rose the dawn not in veils of gold and amber was she dressed a robe of mourning formed of clouds composed her mantle and with discontented light hidden were the stars and planets though for this one time alone they were happy in their absence searching there in every part we approached where blood was spattered on the tender dewy flower and upon the ground some fragments of a woman's dress were strewn by these signs once attracted we went on till at the foot of a great rock or hanging in a fragrant tomb of roses lay polonia dead and stabbed there scene thirteen polonia dead and afterwards patrick the same turn your eyes and here you see the young tree of beauty blasted pale and sad the opening flower the bright flame abruptly darkened see here loveliness laid prostrate see warm life here turn to marble see alas polonia dead philip cease proceed no farther for i have not a resignation to bear up with any calmness gainst so many forms of wrong gainst so many shapes of sadness gainst such manifold misfortunes ah my daughter ah thou hapless treasure fatally found for me grief my feeling so o'ermasters that i have not breath to mourn ah of all thy woes the partner let thy wretched sister be what rude hand and roughing anger raised its bloody steel against beauty so divinely fashioned sorrow sorrow ends my life patrick within woe to thee sin-stained arlanda woe to thee unhappy people if with tears thou dost not water the hard earth and night and day weeping in thy bitter anguish ope the golden gates of heaven which thy disobedience fastened woe to thee unhappy people woe to thee sin-stained irlanda heavens what mournful tones are these what are these sad solemn accents that transpierce my very heart that cut through me like a dagger learn who thus disturbs the flowing of my grief's most tender channels who but i should so lament who but i should wail thus sadly this my lord is patrick who having as you know departed from this country went to rome where the pontiff the great father made him bishop and a post of pre-eminence imparted to him here through all the islands he proceedeth in this manner patrick enters woe to thee unhappy people woe to thee sin-stained irlanda patrick thou who thus my grief interrupted and my sadness doubled with thy golden words hiding false and poisonous matter why thus persecute me wherefore thus disturb the hills and valleys of my kingdom with deceptions and new-fangled laws and maxims here we know but this alone we are born and die our fathers left us this the simple doctrine taught by nature and no farther have we sought to learn what god can be this of whom such marvels you relate who life eternal gives when temporal life departeth can the soul when it is severed from the body be so active as to have another life 
or of bale or bliss hereafter? Being loosened from the body, and the human portion having given to nature, it being only but a little dust and ashes, then the spirit upward rises to the higher sphere attracted, where its labors find their center. If it dies in grace, which baptism first confers upon the soul, and then penance ever after. Then this beauteous one, that here lies in her own blood bedabbled, there is living at this moment? Yes. A sign, a proof, then, grant me of this truth. Patrick aside. Almighty God, for thy glory deign to hearken. It behoveth thee to show here thy power by an example. What? You do not answer? Heaven wishes for itself to answer. He extends his hands over the dead body of Polonia. In the name of God, of course. Lying stiff here, I command thee to arise and live, resuming thine own soul, and thus make patent this great truth, before us preaching the true doctrine and evangel. Polonia arising. Woe is me! Oh, save me, heaven! <gasps> What secrets are imparted to the soul? O oh Lord, O oh Lord, stay the red hand of thy anger, of thy justice. Do not threaten against a woman weak and abject, the dread thunders of thy rigor, of thy power the lightning's flashes. Where, or oh, where shall I conceal me from thy countenance, if haply thou art wroth? Ye rocks, ye mountains, fall upon and overcast me, hating mine own self today, would that to my prayer twas granted in the center of earth from thy side to hide and mask me? Ah, but why? If wheresoever my unhappy fate might cast me, there I brought with me my sin. See ye, see ye not this atlas back recede, and this huge mountain tremble to its base? The axes of the firmament are loosened, and its perfect fabric hangeth threatening ruin o'er my head with terrific pride and grandeur. Darker grows the air around me. Chained my feet proceed no further. Even the seas retire before me. What? Here fly me not, nor startle, are the wild beasts which to rend me bit by bit come on to attack me. Mercy, mighty Lord, O oh, mercy! Pardon, gracious Lord, O oh, pardon! Holy Baptist, I implore, that in grace I may depart hence. Mortals hear, O oh, mortals hear! Christ is living, Christ is master, Christ is God, the one true God. Penance, penance, penance practice. Exit. Scene 14. The same with the exception of polonia how prodigious how stupendous what a miracle what a marvel what enchantment what bewitchment who can bear this who can grant this christ, christ is god, god the one true god. god what a bold deceit is practised here blind people to deceive you in the making of these marvels which you have not sense to see are in an outward show but acted and within are fraud however that the truth be now established i will own myself convinced if in argument shall patrick prove his case and so attend as the grave dispute advances if the soul was made immortal it could never be inactive even for a single moment yes and every dream that passes proves this truth because the dreams that engender numerous phantoms are discourses of the soul that never sleeps. And as these shadows simulate the imperfect actions of the senses, a strange language and imperfect is produced. And tis thus that in their trances men dream things that are at once inconsistent and fantastic. Well then, this being so, I ask was Polonia, when this happened, dead or not? For if but only in a swoon, what mighty marvel then was done? But this I pass. If she really had departed, then to one of the two places, heaven or hell, so named, O Patrick, by yourself, it must have gone. If it was in heaven, 
twas hardly merciful in god to send it back into this world to hazard a new chance of condemnation when twas once in grace and happy this is surely true if likewise it had been in hell tis adverse to strict justice since it were not just that that which by its badness once had earned such punishment should again be given the chances of regaining grace it must i presume be taken as granted that god's justice and his mercy cannot possibly be parted where i asked then was her soul here egarius the answer i can see that for the soul sanctified by holy baptism heaven or hell must be its goal out of which by god's commandment speaking of his usual power it can never more be absent but if of his absolute power there is question god could drag it even from hell itself but this is not what we have to argue that the soul doth go to either of those places must be granted when tis severed from the body once for all by a mortal absence to return to it no more but when otherwise commanded to it to return it waiteth in a certain state of passage and remains as twere suspended in the universe not having any special place allotted for the almighty mind forecasting all things when from out his essence as the exemplar the fair pattern of his thought this glorious fabric he brought forth the light and gladness saw this very incident and well knowing what would happen that this soul would here return kept it for a while inactive seemingly unfixed yet fixed this is the authentic answer that theology that sacred science gives to what you have asked me but another point remaineth there are other places mark me both of glory and of pain than you think and of these latter one is called the purgatory where the soul of him who happily dies in grace is purged from stains sinful stains which it contracted in the world for into heaven none can pass till these are cancelled and thus there tis purified cleansed by fire from all that tarnished till to god's divinest presence pure and clean at length it passes so you say and i have nothing to confirm what you advance here but your word some proof now give me give me something i can handle something tangible to convince me of this truth that i may grasp it and know what it is and since so much power and influence have you with your god implore his grace that i may believe the faster some material fact to give me something that we all can grapple not mere creatures of the mind and remember that at the farthest but an hour remains in which you must give me sure and ample signs of punishment and glory or you die these mighty marvels of your god here let them come where the truth we can examine for ourselves and if we neither heaven or hell deserve to have here show us then this purgatory which is different from the latter so that here we all may know his omnipotence and grandeur mind god's honour rests upon you tell him to defend and guard it exeunt all but patrick scene fifteen patrick here mighty lord dart down thy searching glance armed with the dreadful lightnings of thine ire winged with thy vengeance as the bolt with fire and rout the squadrons of fell ignorance come not in pity to the hostile band treat not as friends thy enemies abhorred but since they ask for portents mighty lord come with the blood-red lightnings in thy hand of old elias asked with burning sighs for chastisement and moses did display wonders and portents in the self-same way listen o lord to my beseeching cries and though i be not great or good as they still let my accents pierce the listening skies portents and chastisement both day and night i ask o lord may from thy hand be given that purgatory hell and heaven may be revealed unto these mortals sight scene sixteen a good angel at one side and on the other a bad angel patrick bad angel to himself fearful that the favouring skies may accede to patrick's prayer and discover to him where earth's most wondrous treasure lies 
like a minister of light full of scorn i hither fly it to chill and nullify covering with my poison blight his petition then give o'er cruel monster for in me his protecting angel see but be silent speak no more to patrick patrick god has heard thy prayer he has listened to thy vows and as thou hast asked allows earth's great secrets to lie bare seek along this island ground for a vast and darksome cave which restrains the lake's dark wave and supports the mountains round he who dares to go therein having first contritely told all his faults shall there behold where the soul is purged from sin he shall see with mortal eyes hell itself where those who die in their sins forever lie in the fire that never dies he shall see in blessed fruition where the happy spirits dwell but of this be sure as well he who without due contrition enters there to idly try what the cave may be doth go to his death he'll suffer woe while the lord doth reign on high who thy soul this day shall free from this poor world's weariness it is thus that god doth bless those who love his name like thee he shall grant to thee in pity bliss undreamed by mortal men making thee a denizen of his own celestial city he shall to the world proclaim his omnipotence and glory by the wondrous purgatory which shall bear thy sainted name lest thou think the promise vain of this miracle divine i will take this shape malign which came hither to profane thy devotion and within this dark cavern's dark abyss fling it there to howl and hiss in the everlasting din they disappear glory glory unto thee mighty lord the heavens proclaim miracles attest thy name wonders show that thou must be calling king scene seventeen the king philip lesbia leoger the captain people patrick what wouldst thou come with me through this mountain woodland drear thou and all thy followers here thou and they shall see therein the dark place reserved for sin and rewards delightful sphere they shall have a passing view of a sight no tongue can tell an unending miracle to whose greatness shall be due their amazement ever new who its secrets shall unveil yes a perfect image pale in the wonders guarded here shall they see with awe and fear of the realms of bliss and bale exit followed by all scene eighteen a remote part of the mountain with the mouth of a horrible cave the same look o patrick for you go turning towards a part forbidden where the light of the sun is hidden even in the noontide's glow through this wilderness of woe even the hunter in pursuit of his prey ne'er placed a foot on its tactless wild walks green since for ages it has been shunned alike by man and brute we for many and many a year who have lived here from our youth never dared to learn the truth of the secrets hidden here for the entrance did appear in itself enough to make even the bravest heart to quake no one yet has dared to brave the wild rocks that guard this cave or the waters of this lake and for auguries we heard borne the troubled wind along oft the sad funereal song of some low nocturnal bird be the rash attempt deferred let not causeless fear arise for a treasure of the skies here is hidden what is fear could it ever me come near in an earthquake's agonies no for though the flame should break as from some sulphurous lake and the mountain sides run red from the molten fires outshed they could ne'er my courage shake never make me fear scene nineteen polonia the same oh stay wandering from the path astray hapless crowd rush indiscreet turn away your erring feet for misfortune lies that way 
Here, from myself, with hurried footsteps flying, I dare to treat this wilderness profound, Beneath the mountain whose proud top defying The pure bright sunbeam is with huge rocks crowned, Hoping that here, as in its dark grave lying, Never my sin could on the earth be found, And I myself might find a port of peace, Where all the tempests of the world might cease. No polar star had hostile fate decreed me, As on my perilous path I dare to stray. So great is pride, no hand presumed to lead me, And guide my silent footstep on its way. Not yet the aspect of the place has freed me From the dread terror, anguish and dismay, Which were awakened by this mountain's gloom, And all the hidden wonders of its womb. See ye not here this rock some power secureth, That grasps with awful toil the hillside brown, And with the very anguish it endureth, Age after age seems slowly coming down. Suspended there with effort it obscureth The mighty cave beneath, which it doth crown, And open mouth the horrid cavern shapes, Wherewith the melancholy mountain gapes. This, then, by a mournful cypress tree surrounded, Between the lips of rocks at either side, Reveals a monstrous neck of length unbounded, Whose tangled hair is scantily supplied By the wild herbs that there the wind hath grounded, A gloom whose depths no sun has ever tried, A space, a void, the gladsome days of fright, The fatal refuge of the frozen night. I wished to enter there to make my dwelling within the cave. But here my accents fail, my troubled voice against my will, rebelling, doth interrupt so terrible a tale. What novel horror, all the past excelling, must I relate to you with cheeks all pale, without cold terror on my bosom seizing, and even my voice, my breath, my pulses freezing. I scarcely had overcome my hesitation and gone within the cavern's vault profound when I heard wails of hopeless lamentation, despairing shrieks that shook the walls around, curses and blasphemy and desperation, dark crimes avowed that would even hell astound, which heaven, I think, in order not to hear, had hid within this prison dark and drear. Let him come here who doubts what I am telling. Let him here bravely enter who denies. Soon shall he hear the sounds of dreadful yelling. Soon shall the horrors gleam before his eyes. For me my voice is hushed, my bosom swelling, pants now with terror, now with strange surprise. Nor is it right that human tongue should dare high heaven's mysterious secrets to lay bare. This cave, O king, which here you see, concealeth the mysteries of life as well as death. Not, I should say, for him whose bosom feeleth no true repentance, or no real faith, but he who boldly enters, who revealeth his sins, confessing them with penitent breath, shall see them all forgiven, his conscience clear, and have alive his purgatory here. And dost thou think, O Patrick, that I owe my blood so little as to yield to dread? and trembling fear like a weak woman show. Say, who shall be the first this cave to tread? What's silent, Philip? Sire, I dare not go. Then, Captain, thou? Enough to strike me dead, is even to thought. Leoguer, thou surely dare. The heavens, my lord, themselves exclaim, forbear. Oh, cowards, lost to every sense of shame, unfit to gird the warrior's sword around your shrinking loins. <laughs> Men are ye but in name. Well, I myself shall be the first to sound the depths of this enchantment, and proclaim unto this Christian that my heart unawed nor dreads his incantations, nor his God. Egerius advances to the cave, and on entering, sinks into it with much noise. Flames rise from below, and many voices are heard. How terrible! How awful! What a wonder! The earth is breathing out its central fire. Exit. The axes of the sky are burst asunder. Exit. 
The heavens are loosening their collected ire. Exit. The earth doth quake and peals the sullen thunder. Exit. O mighty Lord, who will not now admire thy wondrous works? Exit. Oh, who that's not insane will enter Patrick's purgatory again? Exit. End of Act Two. Act Three of The Purgatory of St. Patrick by Pedro Calderon de la Barca. Translated by Dennis Florence McCarthy. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act the Third. A Street, It is Night. Scene 1. One Paul, dressed ridiculously as a soldier, and Luis Ennius, very pensive. Yes, the day would come, I knew, after long procrastination, when a word of explanation I should ask to have with you. Come with me, you said, though dark, off I trudged with heavy heart, to point out to you the part where at morn you could embark. Then again, with thundering voice, thus you spoke, Where must I fly? Choose to come with me, or die. And since you allowed a choice, of two wills I chose the worst, which, sir, was to go with you. As your shadow, then I flew, Across the sea to England first, then to Scotland, then to France, then to Italy and Spain, round the world and back again, as in some fantastic dance, not a country, great or small, could escape you, till, good lack, here we are in Ireland back. Now, sir, I... Plain Juan Paul, being perplexed to know what draws you here now with beard and hair, grown so long, your speech, your air changed so much, would ask the cause, why you these disguises wear. You by day ne'er leave the inn, but when cold night doth begin, you a thousand follies dare, without bearing this in mind, that now we are in a land wholly changed from strand to strand, where, in fact, we nothing find as we left it. The old king died despairing, and his heir, Lesbia, now the crown doth wear, for her sister, hapless thing, poor Polonia, Oh, that name do not mention, do not kill me by repeating what doth thrill me to the centre of my frame as with lightning. Yes, I know that at length Polonia died. Yes, our host was at her side. He himself has told me so. When they found her dead and... Cease! of her death oh speak no more tis sufficient to deplore and to pray that she's at peace leaving heathen sin and crime all the people far and near are become good christians here for one patrick who some time now is dead is patrick dead so i from our host have heard Luis aside. Badly have I kept my word, but proceed. The teaching spread of the faith of Christ, and gave, as a proof complete and whole, of the eternity of the soul, the discovery of a cave. Oh, it's the very name doth send terror through me. Yes, I have heard of that cave, and every word made my hair to stand on end. Those who in the neighbourhood dwell see wonders every day. 
Since, mid terror and dismay, in your melancholy mood, you will no one hear or see, ever locked within your room. It is plain you have not come, ought to learn how strange they be of these things. It doth appear of the work you are about. Satisfy my foolish doubt, and say why we have come here. To your questions thus I yield. Yes, I forced you, as you mention, from your house, and my intention was to kill you in the field. But I thought it best instead you to make my steps attend, as my comrade and my friend, shaking off the mortal dread which forbade me to endure any stranger, and, in fine, that your arms being joined with mine, I might feel the more secure. Many a land both far and near, passing through you fared right well, and now, answering, I will tell why it is that we come here, and tis this, I come to slay, here a man who did me wrong, tis for this I pass along, muffled in this curious way, hiding country, dress, and name, and the night suits best for me, for my powerful enemy can the first position claim in the land, since I avow why I hither have been led, listen now how I have sped in my project until now. I, three days ago, was brought to this city in disguise, for two nights beneath the skies I, my enemy, have sought in his street and at his door. Twice a muffled figure came and disturbed me in my aim. Twice he called and stalked before him I followed in the street. But when I, the figure, neared, suddenly he disappeared as if wings were on his feet i this third night have brought you that should this mysterious shape come again he shan't escape being caught between us two who he is we then shall see two who are they you and i i'm not one not one how why no sir no i cannot be one nor half a one these stories faith would frighten fifty hectares what know i of lady spectres or of lord don purgatories all through life i've kept aloof from the other world's affairs shunning much superfluous cares but my courage put to proof bid me face a thousand men and if i don't cut and run from the thousand nay from one never trust to me again for i think it quite a case fit for bedlam if so high that a man would rather die than just take a little race such a trifle sir to me life is precious leave me here where you'll find me never fear here's the house to-night i'll be philip your predestined fate now we'll see if heaven pretends to defend him and defends watch here you beside the gate scene two a muffled figure luis and paul there's no need to watch for hither someone comes a lucky mortal am I, if the hour draws nigh, that will two revenges offer, since this night there then will be naught to interrupt my project, slaying first this muffled figure, and then Philip, slow and solemn, comes this man again. I know him by his gait, but whence this horror that comes o'er me as I see him, this strange awe that chills, that shocks me? Louis Aeneas. Sir, 
I've seen you here the last two nights. Your object? If you call me, wherefore fly thus? If tis me you seek, why mock me by retiring? Follow me, then you will know my name. I am stopped here in the street by a little business. To be quite alone imports me, wherefore first by killing you I'll be free to kill another. He draws his sword, but merely cuts the air. Draw, then, draw your sword or not. Thus the needful path I shorten to two acts of vengeance. Heavens! I but strike the air, cut nothing, sever nothing else. Quick, Paul, stop him as he stalks off yonder, near to you. I'm bad at stopping. Then your footsteps I will follow everywhere until I learn who you are. Aside. In vain his body do I strive to pierce. O oh, heavens, lightnings flash from off my sword here, but in no way can I touch him as if sword and arm were shortened. Exit following the figure, striking at it without touching it. Scene 3. Philip. Paul. Paul aside. God be with you both, but scarce has one vanished when another comes to haunt me. Why, I'm tempted by strange phantoms and hobgoblins, like another San Antonio. In this doorway I'll ensconce me, till my friend here kindly passes. Love, ambitious, bold, deep-plotted, with the favours of a kingdom, me thou makest a prosperous lover. To the desert fled Polonia, where, mid savage rocks and forests, citizen of mighty mountains, islander of lonely grottoes, she doth dwell, to Lesbia leaving crown and kingdom. Through a stronger greed than love, I, Lesbia, court, for a queen is worth my homage. From her trellis I have come, from a sweet and pleasant converse, but what's this? Each night I stumble on a man here on my doorstep. Who is there? Paul aside. To me he's coming. Why on earth should every goblin pounce on me? Sir, Caballero? These are names I don't acknowledge. He can't speak to me. This house is my home which I don't covet. May you for an age enjoy it without belays. If important business in this street detains you, not a word whereon I offer, give me room that I may pass. Paul aside. Somewhat timid, though quite proper, goblins can be cowards too. Yes, sir, for a certain office I am here, Go in, and welcome. I, no gentleman, would stop here, bound for bed, nor is it right. The condition I acknowledge. Aside. Well, fine spectres, to be sure, haunt this street. Each night I notice that a man here comes before me, but when I approach him softly, hereabouts on my own threshold, I, as now, have always lost him. But what matters this to me? Exit. Paul draws his sword and makes several flourishes. As he's gone, the right and proper thing is this. Stay, stay, cold shadow. Whether you're a ghost or ghostess, I can't reach it. Why, by heaven, ere alone I cut and chop here. But if this is he we wait for, in the night-time like two blockheads, faith, he is a lucky fellow to have got to bed so promptly. But another noise I hear, sounding from that dark street yonder, 
"'tis of swords and angry voices. "'There I run to reconnoiter. Exit. Scene four. Another street. The muffled figure and Luis. Sir, already we have issued from the street. If aught there stopped us, we are here alone, and may hand to hand resume the combat, and since powerless is my sword, thee to wound, I throw me on thee to know who thou art. Declare, art thou demon, man, or monster? What? No answer? Then I thus dare myself to solve the problem. He tears the cloak from the figure and finds beneath it a skeleton. And find out, oh, save me, heaven, God, what's this I see? What horrid spectacle, what frightful vision, what death-frightening fearful portent, stiff and stony course, who art thou, that of dust and ashes form it, now dost live? not know thyself this is thy most faithful portrait i alas am lewis Aeneas. disappears save me heaven what words of horror save me heaven what sight of woe prey of shadows and misfortunes ah i die he falls on the ground. Scene 5. Paul. Luis. It is the voice of my master. Succor cometh opportunely now in me, sir. Ah, uh, why return, dread monster? I am overwhelmed. I faint here at your voice. All aside. God help his noodle, he's gone mad. Dread monster, no. I am one Paul, that donkey who, not knowing why or wherefore, is your servant. Ah, uh, good, honest Paul, I knew you not. So frightened am I, but at that why wonder if myself i do not know did you see a fearful course here a dead body with a soul an apparent man supported by his skeleton alone bones from which the flesh had rotted fingers rigid gaunt and cold naked trunk uncouth abhorrent vacant spaces whence the eyes having fallen left bare the sockets whither has he gone if i saw that ghost upon my honour i could never say i saw it for more dead than that dead body i have fallen on the other side at the moment and no wonder for my voice was mute my breath choked my heart's warm beat forgotten clothed with ice were all my senses shod with lead my feet my forehead cold with sweat i saw suspended heaven's two mighty poles upon me the brief atlases sustaining such a burden being my shoulders it appeared as if there started rocks from every tender blossom giants from each opening rose for the earth's disrupted hollows wished from out their graves to cast forth the dead who lay there rotten ah among them i beheld louis ennius heaven be softened hide me hide me from myself bury me 
in some deep corner of earth's centre. Let me never see myself, since no self-knowledge have I had. But now I have it, now I know I am that monster of rebellion, who defied in my madness, pride and folly, God himself, the same whose crimes are so numerous and so horrid that it were slight punishment if the whole wrath of the Godhead was outpoured on me, and whilst God was God, eternal torments I should have to bear in hell. But I have this further knowledge. They were done against a God so divine that he has promised to grant pardon if my sins I with penitent tears acknowledge such I shed, and, Lord, to prove that to-day to be another, I begin, being born anew, to thy hands, my soul I offer, not as a strict judge, then judge me, for the attributes of the Godhead are his justice and his mercy, with the latter, not the former. Judge me then, and fix what penance I shall do to gain that object. What will be the satisfaction of my life? Music within the purgatory. Bless me, heaven! What's this I hear? A sweet strain, divine and solemn, it appears a revelation from on high, since heaven doth often help mysteriously the sinner, and since I herein acknowledge a divine interposition, I will go into the purgatory called of Patrick and fulfil humbly, faithfully, the promise which I gave him long ago, if it is my happy fortune to see Patrick, if the attempt is, as rumour hath informed me, most terrific, since no human strength avails against the horrors of the place, or resolution to endure the demon's torments, still my sins I must remember were as dreadful skilful doctors give for dangerous diseases dangerous remedies to stop them come then with me paul and see how here penitent and prostrate at the bishop's feet i'll kneel and confess for greater wonder all my awful sins aloud go alone then for that project since so brave a man as you are has no need of an accomplice, and there is no one I have heard of who e'er went to hell escorted by his servant. I'll go home, and live pleasantly in my cottage without care. If ghosts there be, I'm content with matrimony. Exit. Public were my sins, and so public penance I will offer in atonement. Like one crazed, crying in the crowded crossways, I'll confess aloud my crimes, men, wild beasts, rude mountains, forests, globes celestial, flinty rocks, tender plants, dry elms, thick coppice, know that I am Louis Ennius, tremble at my name that monster once of pride as now i am of humility the wonder i have faith and certain hope of great happiness before me if in god's great name shall patrick aid me in the purgatory exit scene six a wood in the centre of which is seen a mountain, from which Polonia descends. Polonia. To thee, O Lord, my spirit climbs. To thee, from every lonely hill, I burn to sacrifice my will a thousand and a thousand times. 
and such my boundless love to thee, I wish each will of mine a living soul could be. Would that my love I could have shown by leaving for thy sake, instead of that poor crown that pressed my head, some proud imperial crown and throne, some empire which the sun surveys through all its daily course and gilds with constant rays. This lowly grot, neath rocks uphurled, in which I dwell, though poor and small, a spur of that stupendous wall, the eighth great wonder of the world, doth in its little space excel the grandest palace where a king doth dwell, far better on some natural lawn, to see them mourn its gems be true, or watch it weeping pearls of dew within the wide arms of the dawn or view before the sun the stars drive o'er the brightening plain their swiftly fading cars far better in the mighty main as night comes on and clouds grow grey to see the golden coach of day drive down amid the waves of spain but be it dark or be it bright o lord i praise thy name by day and night than to endure the inner strife the spacious glare, that real weight of pomp and power and pride and state, and all the vanities of life. How would we shudder could we deem that life itself, in truth, is but a fleeting dream? Scene 7. Luis, Polonia. Luis, aside. To my purpose on I go with footsteps firm and bosom brave, seeking for that mysterious cave wherein the pitying heavens will show how I salvation there may gain by bearing in this life the purgatorial pain. To Polonia. Tell me, O holy woman, thou who in these wilds a home has found a dweller in this mountain ground obedient to some sacred vow which is the road to patrick's cave where penitential man his soul in life may save o oh, happy traveller who here has come so far in storm and shine within this treasury divine to feel and find salvation near well can i guide thee on thy way since tis for this alone amid these wilds i stray seest thou this mountain ah i see my death in it polonia aside my heart grows cold ah who is this that i behold luis aside i cannot think it is it she polonia aside Tis Louis, now I know. Louis aside. Perhaps illusion it may be to baffle my intent and lead my erring feet astray. To Polonia. Proceed. Polonia aside. Say, can it be to conquer me the common enemy doth send this spectre here? You do not speak. Attend. This mighty mountain, rock bestrown, full well the dreaded secret knows, but no one to its centre goes by any path or land alone. He who would see this wondrous cave must in a bark put forth and tempt the lake's dark wave. Aside. I struggle with a wish to wreak revenge, which pity doth subdue. Luis, aside. It doth my happiness renew once more to see and hear her speak. Polonia aside. Within me opposite thoughts contend. Luis aside. Ah, me, I die. You do not speak. Attend. This darksome lake doth all surround the lofty mountain's ragged base. And so to reach the awful place, an easy passage may be found. A sacred convent in the island stands, midway between the mountain and the sands. Some pious priests inhabit there, and for this task alone they live, with loving zeal to freely give the helping hand, the strengthening prayer, confession and the holy mass, 
and every needful help to all who thither pass, telling them what they first must do before they dare presume to go alive within the realm of woe. Aside. Let not this enemy subdue my soul, O Lord. Luis, aside. My hopes are fair. Let me not feel, O Lord, the anguish of despair. Seeing before my startled sight my greatest, deepest crime arise, let not the fiend, my soul that tries, subdue me in this dreadful fight. Polonia, aside. Against what a powerful foe must I defend myself today? You do not speak. Attend. With quicker speed your story tell, for well I know my soul hath need that I should go with swifter speed. And me it doth import as well that you should go away. Agreed. Now, woman, point the way to where my path doth lead. No one accompanied can brave the terrors of this gloomy lake, and so a skiff you needs must take and try alone the icy wave. Being in that most trying strait, the absolute master of your acts and fate. Come where within a secret cave, beside the shore the boat doth lie, and trusting in the Lord on high, embark upon the crystal wave of this remote lone inland sea. My life and all I have I place, O Lord, in thee, and so I trust me to the bark, but O oh, my soul, what sight is here? A coffin doth the bark appear, and I, upon the waters dark, alone must cross the icy tide. He enters. O oh, turn not back, but follow and confide. Luis within. I've conquered sweet Polonia's shade, since sight of thee has not undone my shuddering soul. And I have won here in this Babylon delayed, or a wrath and rage the victory. Luis within. Thy feigned resemblance does not frighten me, though thou dost take a form, might tempt my steps astray, and make me turn despairing from my way. Thy fear doth badly thee inform, poor to be brave and rich to be afraid. For I, Polonia, am, and not her shade, the same that thou didst slay, but who, by God's decree, restored to life, even in this misery, is happier far today. Luis within. Since I my sinful state confess, and feel too well its fearful weight, thy wrong, oh, pardon too. I give it, and approve of thy design. Luis within. My faith, at least, I never will resign. That grace will be thy safeguard. Luis within. Then adieu. Adieu. Luis within. May God in pity save. And bring thee back victorious from the cave. Scene 8. The entrance of a convent at the end of the cave of Patrick. Two canons, regular, afterwards Luis. See, the waters of the lake move, although no breeze doth blow. Without doubt today some pilgrim roweth to this island shore. Come unto the strand to see who can be so brave and bold as to seek our gloomy dwelling, crossing the dark waters all. Enter Luis. Here my boat my coffin, rather, on the billows I bestow, who his sepulchre has ever steered, as I, through fire and snow. What a pleasant spot is this! Here has spring, methinks, invoked, flowers of high and low degree, to assemble at her court. But this dismal mountain here, how unlike the plain below, Yet they are the better friends by the contrasts that they show. There, 
the mournful birds of prey hoarsely croak presaging woe hear the warblers in their joy charm us with their tuneful notes there the torrents leaping headlong fright us with their frenzied roar here the crystal streamlets gliding mirror back the sun's bright gold halfway twixt that ugliness and this beauty i behold a plain building whose grave front fear and love at once provokes happy wanderer who here hast arrived with heart so bold come unto my arms the ground that you tread on suits me more oh for charity conduct me to the prior of your fold to the abbot of this convent though unworthy you behold him in me speak what's your wish father if my name i told i'm afraid that swiftly flying with a terror uncontrolled you would leave me for my works are so shocking to unfold that to see them not the sun wraps him round in mourning robes i am an abyss of crimes a wild sea that has no shore i am a broad map of guilt and the greatest sinner known yes in me to tell it briefly in one comprehensive word here my breath doth almost fail me louis ennius behold i come here this cave to enter if for sins so manifold aught can ever satisfy let my penance thus atone to the bishop of hibernia i've confessed and am absolved who informed of my intention with a gracious love consoled all my fears and unto thee sent these letters i unfold do not in a single day take my son a step so bold for these things require precaution more than can at once be told stay here as our guest some days then at leisure we can both see about it and decide no my father no oh no never from the ground i'll rise where here prostrate i am thrown till you grant to me this good it was god that touched my soul and inspired me to come here not a vain desire to know not ambition to find out secrets god perchance withholds do not baffle this intention for the call is heaven's alone o oh, my father yield in pity with me in my griefs condole give my sorrows consolation heal the anguish of my soul luis you have not considered what you ask of me you know nothing of the infernal torments you must bear to undergo these your strength is insufficient many are there more the woe who go in but few alas who return your threats forebode much but still they fright not me for i do protest i go but to purge away my sins which if numbered are much more than the atoms of the sun and the sands upon the shore i will ever have my hope firmly fixed upon the lord at whose holy name even hell is subdued the fervid glow of your words compels me now to unlock the awful doors luis you behold the cave see he opens the mouth of the cave oh save me gracious god what dismayed no not dismayed still it scared me to behold i admonish you again for no lesser cause to go than a firm belief that there for your sins you may atone father i am in the cave listen to my voice once more men and wild beasts skies and mountains day and night and sun and moon to you all i here protest i a thousand times make known that i enter here to suffer torments for my sins untold for so great so dread a penance is but little to atone 
for such sins as mine, believing that the cave salvation holds. Enter then, and in your mouth, as within your heart's deep core, be the name of Jesus. Be with me, Lord, O gracious Lord, for here, armed but with thy faith, I am pitted against my foe in the open field. That name will my enemy o'erthrow. Crossing myself many times, I advance. Oh, save me, God! He enters the cave, which they close. Of the many who have entered, none has equal courage shown. O oh, enable him, just Jesus, to resist the demon host and their wiles, relying ever upon thee, divinest Lord. Exunt. Scene 9. Lesbia, Philip, Leoger, the captain, and Polonia. Before we reach the place whither you wish to lead us for a space, let us say why we came to see you here today, a definite aim all of us here has brought. Speak as we go, whatever be your thought, still following where I lead. For I, a sight that doth all sights exceed, will bring you here to see. What then our wishes were you hear from me? Polonia, you desired in this wild mountain waste to live retired, making of me the heir while living of your kingdom. I would share with you in turn my plans, however small, and so I hither come to tell you all. My will is in your hands. I ask not counsel, sister, but commands. A single woman scarce can ever be strong enough through advice, and of necessity she must be married. Yes, and if your choice has fallen on Philip, I may well rejoice, for then to me you owe both crown and husband. May you live whilst glow the sun's bright beams, that orb which dies at night, and phoenix of its rays is born with morning's light. Then since you thus have gained your wish, ye too, now free and unconstrained, listen to what I tell, and all who hear me listen too as well. With all the outward show of fervour came a man, whom we all know, seeking for patrick's cave to enter there and so his soul to save he entered it and cometh forth to-day and tis because my terror and dismay are balanced by my wonder that with me i bring you to behold this holy prodigy i do not tell you who he is lest fear should so my heart make craven that i ne'er could reach the end i sought tis for this object that you here are brought it is but only right that I should mingle terror with delight. If strength from him hath fled, and he extended in the cave lies dead, at least will show his punishment. And if he comes, will know the mystery that is here. If save he comes, who cometh forth, through fear perhaps he may not speak, but flying men some solitude may seek to leave and die alone what mighty mysteries lie here unknown the time is opportune that we come here for the religious whom we see draw near o bait in tears no go to the cave's mouth in solemn silent row to throw the gates aside scene ten the procession advances to the cave the gates are opened by the prior and his assistants luis ennius comes forth astonished the same and those of heaven o lord keep open wide to penitent tears and sighs may this poor sinner from these dungeons rise this dark and dismal place where never shines the radiance of thy face the gate is opened oh what happiness tis luis bless me heaven in pity bless ah is it possible that i am here again on earth after so many a year and that once more i see the light of the sun how oh, rapt how dazed is he embrace us all my son my arms were prison chains to every one polonia since thou art here 
thy pity I may claim without a fear, and thou, O Philip, know that thrice an angel saved thee from the blow of my sharp sword two nights i watched for thee to slay thee may my error pardoned be now flying from myself oh let me hide and in some wilderness abide far from the world in solitude and pain for he who saw what i have seen would fain so suffering live so die then on the part of god o aeneas i command thee what thou hast seen at once to say so sacred a command i must obey and that the startled world may now begin a better course and man from mortal sin my words may waken like some midnight wail listen o grave assembly to my tale after all the preparations fit and solemn were effected which in such a perilous case might be needed and expected and when i from all around me firm in faith with courage strengthened tenderly farewell had taken this dark cavern here to enter i my trust reposed in god and my lips repeating ever those mysterious mystic words at which even the demons tremble i then placed me on the threshold where until as expected they would close the gate i stood it was closed and i remember then i found me in black night whence the light was so ejected that i closed on it mine eyes a strange way it seems but certain to see better in the dark with my lids thus closed together on i went and felt a wall which in front of me extended and by following it and groping for about the length of twenty paces came upon some rocks and perceived through a small crevice of this rugged mountain wall that a doubtful glimmer entered of a light that was not light and when the day the dark disperses of tis morning or not morning oft the twilight is uncertain with a light steps a path pursuing by the left-hand side i entered when i felt a strange commotion the firm earth began to tremble and upheaving neath my feet ruin and convulsion threatened stupefied i stopped there when with a voice which woke my senses from forgetfulness and fainting loud a thunder-clap re-echoed and the ground on which i stood bursting open in the centre it appeared as if i fell to a depth where i lay buried in the loosened stones and earth which had after me descended then i found me in a hall built of jasper where the presence of the chisel was made known by its ornate architecture through a door of bronze twelve men then advanced and came directly where i stood who clothed alike in unspotted snow-white dresses with a courteous air received me and too humbly did me reverence one who seemed to be among them the superior said remember that in god you place your faith and that you are not dejected in your battle with the demons for if moved by what they threaten or may promise you turn back you will have to dwell for ever in the lowest depths of hell amid torments most excessive angels were these men for me and so greatly was i strengthened by their counsel and advice that revived i once more felt me on a sudden then the whole hall unto mine eyes presented nothing but infernal visions fallen angels the first rebels and in forms so horrible so disgusting that resemblance it would be in vain to look for and one said to me demented reckless fool who here hast wished 
prematurely to present thee to thy destined punishment and the pains that thou deservest if thy sins are so immense that thyself must needs condemn them since thou in the eye of god never can have hope of mercy why hast thou come here thyself to endure them back on earth then go oh go and end thy life and as thou hast lived so perish then again thou'lt come to see us for hath hell prepared already that dread seat in which thou must sit for ever and for ever i did answer not a word and then giving me some heavy blows my hands and feet they bound tying them with thongs together and then caught and wounded me with sharp hooks of burning metal dragging me through all the cloisters where they lit a fire and left me headlong plunged amid the flames i but cried o oh, jesus help me at the words the demons fled and the fire went out and ended then they brought me to a plain where the blackened earth presented fruits of thistles and of thorns stead of pink and rose sweet scented here a biting wind passed by which with subtle sharpness entered even my bones whose faintest breath like the keenest sword-edge cleft me here in the profoundest depths sadly mournfully lamented myriad souls their parents cursing from whose loins they had descended such despairing shrieks and cries such blaspheming screams were blended such atrocious oaths and curses so repeated and incessant that the very demons shuddered i passed on and in a meadow found me next whose plants and grasses were all flames which waved and bent them as when in the burning august wave the gold ears altogether so immense it was the sight never could make out where it ended this red field and in it lay an uncountable assemblage all recumbent in the fire through their bodies and their members burning spikes and nails were driven these with feet and hands extended were held nailed upon the ground vipers of red fire the entrails gnawed of some while others lying with their teeth in maniac frenzy bit the earth and some there were piecemeal who themselves dismembered and who seemed to die but only to revive and die for ever there the ministers of death flung me from them bound and helpless but at the sweet name of jesus all their fury fled and left me i passed on and found me where some were cured by a strange method of their cruel wounds and torments led and burning pitch were melted and being poured upon their sores made a cautery most dreadful who that hears me will not mourn who that hears this awful lesson will not sigh and will not weep will not fear and will not tremble then i saw a certain building out of which bright rays extended from the windows and the doors as when conflagration settles on a house the flame bursts forth where an opening is presented this they told me is the villa of delights the bath of pleasures the abode of the luxurious where are punished all those women who were in the other life from frivolity excessive too much given to scented waters unguents rouges baths and perfumes i went in 
and there beheld in a tank of cold snow melted many lovely women bathing with an upturned look of terror underneath the water they were the prey of snakes and serpents for the fishes and the sirens of this sea they represented in the clear transparent crystal stiff and frozen were their members icy hard their hair was lifted chattering struck their teeth together passing out the demons brought me to a mountain so tremendous in its height that as it rose through the sky its peak dissevered if it did not tear and rend the vast azure veil celestial in the middle of this peak a volcano stood which belching flames appeared as if to spit them in the very face of heaven from this burning cone this crater fire at intervals ascended in which issued many souls who again its womb re-entered oft repeating and renewing this ascending and descending at this time a scorching wind caught me when i least expected blowing me from where i stood so that instantly it set me in the depths of that abyss i too was shot up a second wind gust came with that it brought myriad legions who impelled me rudely to another part where it seemed i saw assembled all the other souls i had seen but who here were all collected and though this was the abode where the pains were most excessive i remarked that all therein faces bore of glad expression countenances calm and sweet no impatience in their gestures or their words but with their eyes fixed on heaven as if thus set there to ask mercy ever weeping tears of tenderness and penance that it was the purgatory i at once by this detected where the happy souls are purged from their more venial offences i was not subdued even here though the demons stormed and threatened me the more i rather felt by the sight renewed and strengthened then they seeing that they could not shake my constancy presented to my eyes their greatest torments that which is in an especial sense called hell and so they brought me to a river all the herbage of whose banks was flowers of fire and whose stream was sulphur melted the dread monsters of its tide were the hydras and the serpents it was very wide and o'er it was a narrow bridge suspended which but seemed a line no more and so delicate and slender that in my opinion no one without breaking it could ever pass across look here they said by this narrow way tis destined thou must cross see thou the means and for thy o'erwhelming terror see how those have fared who tried before thee and then directly i saw those who tried to pass fall into the stream where serpents tore them in a thousand pieces with their claws and teeth's sharp edges i invoked the name of god and could dare with it to venture to the other side to pass without yielding to the terror of the winds and of the waves though they fearfully beset me yes i passed and in a wood so delightful and so fertile found me that in it i could after what had passed refresh me on my way as i advanced cedars palms their boughs extended trees of paradise indeed as i may with strictness term them all the ground being covered over with the rose and pink together formed a carpet in whose hues white and green and red were blended there the amorous songbirds sang tenderly their sweet distresses keeping with the thousand fountains of the streams 
due time and measure then upon my vision broke a great city proud and splendid which had even the sun itself for its towers and turrets endings all the gates were of pure gold into which had been inserted exquisitely diamonds rubies topaz chrysolite and emerald ere i reached the gates they opened and the saints in long procession solemnly advanced to meet me men and women youths and elders boys and girls and children came all so joyful and contented then the seraphim and angels in a thousand choirs advancing to their golden instruments sang the symphonies of heaven after them at last approached the most glorious and resplendent patrick the great patriarch who his gratulations telling that i had fulfilled my word ere i died as he expected he embraced me all displaying joy and gladness in my welfare thus encouraged he dismissed me telling me no mortal ever while in life that glorious city of the saints could hope to enter that once more unto the world i should go my days to end there finally my way retracing i came back quite unmolested by the dark infernal spirits and at last the gate of entrance having reached you all came forward to receive me and attend me and since i from so much a danger have escaped oh deign to let me pious fathers here remain till my life is happily ended for with this the history closes as it is to us presented by Dionysius the Carthusian, with Henricus Salteriensis, Matthew Paris, Ranulf Higdon, and Caesarius Heisterbeckensis, Marcus Marullus, Mombritius, David Roth, the prudent prelate and vice primate of all Ireland, Belarminus, Demas Serpi, Bede, Jacobus, and Solinus, Messinam and to express it in a word the christian faith and true piety that defend it for the play is ended where its applause i hope commences the end end of act three end of the purgatory of saint patrick by pedro calderon de la barca translated by dennis florence mccarthy